So uh, this uh, sermon has come out of, uh, it first started with uh, the idea that we were going to uh, uh, start a series in First John next week, and so we kind of had a, a tweener week, and we knew it was going to be communion, we knew it was going to be Compassion Sunday, and then also we have spent the last six weeks in a class uh, at the 9.30 hour of that uh, um, Compassion provided for us, and it was called Step Into My Shoes. It also comes from uh, my journey and Gwen's journey uh, as we have dealt with what it means to live in America and have so much, and, and how does God want me as a man, as a father, as a husband, not even so much as a pastor, but how does God want me and how does God want us as believers to be generous with what we have? So I go back to this text, the first sermon I ever preached here, and a lot of you are new, so you won't even remember it, and even if I preached it last week, some of you wouldn't remember it. I mean, that's just how it is. I'm just, just saying. So, um, so if you have a Bible, turn to Luke 3, chapter, uh, Luke chapter 3. I know in, in your sermon notes it says Luke chapter 1. That's wrong. That's my mistake. Uh, well, actually, I, I want to blame Melissa, but it's, I can't blame her. It's actually my mistake. And so if you need a Bible, raise your hand, and yo back there, and Adam will bring you Bibles. So uh, a couple need Bibles, and turn to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3, and I'll be, reading, I'll be starting by reading the first nine verses. They say this. It was now the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius, the Roman Empire. Pontius Pilate was governor over Judea. Herod Antipas was ruler over Galilee. His brother Philip was ruler over Iteria and Trachonitis. Assyria was ruler over Abilene. Annas and Caiaphas were the high priests. At this time, a message from God came to John, the son of Zechariah, who was living in the, in the wilderness. Verse 3 of chapter 3. Then John went from place to place on both sides of the Jordan River, preaching that people should be baptized to show that they had repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. Isaiah had spoken of John when he said this, He is a voice shouting in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. Verse 5. The valley will be filled and the mountains and the hills made level. The curves will be straightened and the tough places made smooth. And all the people will see the the, the salvation sent from God. When the crowds came to John for baptism, he said, you brood of snakes who warned you to flee God's coming wrath. Prove by the way you live that, that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. Don't just say to each other, we're safe, for we are descendants of Abraham. That means nothing, for I tell you, God can create children of Abraham from these very stones. Even now, the, even now, the axe of God's judgment is poised, ready to sever the roots of the trees. Yet every, yes, every tree that does not produce good fruit will be chopped down and thrown into the fire. And we see in these verse, first nine verses that, that John was sent on this earth for a purpose. We all have a purpose. Recently, Walgreens Pharmacy has, has decided that they wanted to change their purpose. And they've decided that for every shot, for every immunization, for every shot, measles shot, uh, that they give in their pharmacies, they, they will then provide a shot to someone across the world who cannot afford to be immunized. That came at great cost. And how it happened is that one of their uh, vice presidents of marketing was at a Willow Creek Summit, and he heard the founder of Tom's Shoes being interviewed by, by, by Bill Hybels. And Tom's shoes is built on the principle that for every single uh, pair of shoes that is bought through our company, we will give a pair of shoes away. It's that one for one reciprocation for everyone that we get, we will give one away. And now as they've gone into clothing and jewelry and all kinds of different apparel and, you know, still shoes, that's their main 
every single time a purchase is made, they give a pair of shoes away. If you buy three shirts and two pairs of shoes, they give five pairs of shoes away. And that will continue to be the, the model. When Walgreens, uh, a VP of marketing, saw that, and he says, you know what? We need to change a part of who we are and what we do. See, folks, we all have a purpose. Each of us is called to be something. Some of us are called to be firefighters. Some of us are called to be teachers or students. Some of us are called to be correctional officers or, you know, law enforcement. Some of us are called to be, you know, stay-at-home moms or stay-at-home dads. But yet we're all called to live out our purpose. We see in chapter 3 that John's purpose was preparation. It says there, in verse 4, Isaiah had spoken of John when he said, He is the voice shouting in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. John's purpose was about pre preparing the world to get ready to hear the words of Jesus. And so if we all have a purpose and John has a purpose, my question for you is, what is your purpose? And whatever your purpose is, Whatever your purpose is on this earth, I still think it, it includes being about a person that honors God in his or her life. Now, if you're going to decide on a purpose, we know from, from leadership and we know from organizational structure and, and theory that you've got to answer three questions. You've got to answer, why am I going to do what, what I'm going to do? What am I going to do, what I'm going to do, and how am I going to do it? And so we're going to look at those three, the why, the what, and the how. And we're going to start first with the what. We see, we get some clues from this, from what John says there uh, in Luke. Luke 3, verse 6 says this. And then all people will see that the salvation sent from God. See, John was sent to prepare the way for people to get ready to see and hear about the person of Christ. John was, was, was getting ready for the, for the world to receive and hear about the person of Christ. And we know that salvation comes from Christ and Christ alone. It doesn't come from being a member of community church. It doesn't come from helping in Awana. It doesn't come from, you know, going to the junior high barbecue or the women of faith simulcast. It doesn't happen because you've been through Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace University or you give 8% or 12% or 18% of your income. That has nothing to do with salvation. Now, those might be a result of salvation because of I've been given much, I give then away, absolutely. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But salvation comes from the person of Christ and Christ alone. In fact, I love how the, 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 the ESV says, uh, verse 6, and it says this, And all flesh shall see, shall see the salvation of God. See, folks, now that Christ has gone on to be with his Father in heaven, we now are the ones left to tell the world about God's salvation. They should see in us. They should hear from us. We should give witness to the fact that Christ is the one and only way to have a relationship with God the Father for all eternity. Christ is the only way to salvation, and now we are the only way that they will ever know. As John was to prepare the way for the Christ, we are now to prepare the way for folks to come and be joined into his glorious kingdom. It's now our responsibility. So my question is, in the what, do people look at your life and say, you know what, I can see through their life, through his life, through her life, that Christ is the way to salvation. Do people see that in your life? John goes on and he says this in verse 8. 
Verse 7, when the crowds came to John for baptism, he said, you brood of snakes who warned you to flee God's coming wrath. Prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. Just, don't just say to, to each other, we're safe, for we are descendants of Israel. The ESV translates is this way. Produce fruit in keeping with your repentance. I can tell if you love God because since you've come to Christ, your life now is different. If you look like, like you did prior to Christ, maybe you haven't come to faith in Christ. Just saying. Not my words. God's word. Let me read it again. Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. We have Abraham as our father, for I tell you, God is able to turn these stones to raising up children for Abraham. So it doesn't make any difference who your grandparents were or who your parents are or who your neighbor is. It just doesn't matter. The what is, am I producing fruit that shows that I have repented of my prior lifestyle and turned myself and walk, and now walking as God would have me to walk? Because you know what repentance is, right? It's not asking for forgiveness and continuing on in the same direction. It's deciding that I, uh, man, I am, I am bankrupt. I am broken. I am in need of a Savior. And so I make this 180 degree turn and I walk in the opposite direction, empowered by the person of Jesus Christ, leaving the old behind and walking in the new. See, and as I walk, I now bear fruit. They're different. They were that way, and now they're this way. We can bring out the list again from Colossians. I won't. I don't have very much time. But, I mean, there's, there's lists. I once was this, but now I'm this. Bearing fruit, walking, showing that I ha am repentant. That's the what. Well, what's the how? John goes on and he, he gives us three examples of the how. Th there in verses 10 to 14, follow along as I read these verses. The crowds ask, what should we do? John replied, if you have two shirts, give one to the poor. If you have food, share it with those who are hungry. So the first one is to the crowd. And he says, you know, how, how, well, I know what the what is now, bear, bear fruits and, and giving with repentance. Well, how do we do that? And John says this. Well, it's very simple. Crowd, the message version says this, give one away. If you have two, give one away. If you have four, maybe give two away. Or maybe three, I don't know. Every time I read this verse, every time I come across this passage, every time I think about generosity, I am so convicted. Because it speaks to, to clothes, and I love clothes. I can tell you where every Tama, Tommy Bahama outlet in California is. I walk in and people call me out by name. I did a little math this week, and I exaggerate a little bit in first service. I'm going to tell you the truth now. First service, I said, that if, if I decided to go through my closet and wear a, a different shirt every day, I wouldn't have to change until, uh, until after Thanksgiving. I, I was lying. It's actually only November 17th. I feel much better about myself now. But we just have so much here. And John says, if you have two, maybe it's time to give one away. Now he goes on and talks to the tax collectors, and he says, you know, there in, in verses 12 and 13, he says this. Even the corrupt tax collectors came to, to be baptize and asked, asked John, teacher, what should we do? He replied, collect no more taxes than the government requires. 
Well, and what he's talking about that then is, you know what, don't be abusive in how you uh, take money from those who are under your authority. And, and that's a good word for us. Don't be abusive for those who are under our authority. Speaks to us as, as parents and em, employers and, in fact, you know, as, as spouses. Don't be abusive towards those who are under your authority. But does it really speak to us because I'm not a tax collector and not many, very many of you are. He also talks to the soldiers. The soldiers in verse 14 ask this, what should we do, ask some soldiers? And John replied, don't extort money or make false accusations and be, be content with your pay. And that's a good word. We should be content. I shouldn't worry about what anybody else has. I shouldn't desire what they have. I should be content with what God has given me. And God has given me so much, hasn't he? I mean, God has blessed us with so much. And every time we think about what God has given us, we, so often we think about financially, don't we? we? We automatically go there. I know I do. But God has given us so much other than finances, hasn't he? For those of you who, are, who uh, weren't at Celebrate Recovery on Friday night, you missed amazing worship. I mean... I was, doing, I was doing the kids on Friday night because the, the holiday weekend, people were out of town. And so, you know, I was like, you know, the, the 18th choice, and that's okay. <laughs> I was. When Pastor Rick calls me up and says, I got nobody else, he means I, I really got nobody else. <laughs> but even, even the kids in the basement could hear how good the worship was. And that's just a blessing from God. One of my good friends, Larry Duncan, uh, he goes to our small group, and, and um, o- over the last year or so, I've just come to love him. I mean, absolutely love him. And he's been out at fire camp for, you know, for, for forever, and he just stopped by the office. And I, and, I, and I literally jumped out of my chair and ran to see him. I was so happy to see him. He just, he, I mean, he's just another guy. I mean, I, I realize I got a bromance going on with Larry. I get that. But it's just, I mean, it's just good to see my friend. After church, we're going to go to paradise and hang out with, with, with our, 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 our two sons and their two wives and our, our little grandson now who's almost one. He's walking, and, and that's just going to fill me up. Now, I'm just talking about me. Just even think about you. God has blessed you, us, me, our church with so much. So we can be content, but that doesn't speak directly to us because it's about soldiers, but we can still get the, the principle. Well, the really, it's the, when John's talking, he's speaking to us. He's speaking to us, and we're part of the crowd. He talks about, you know what, because you have so much, give some away. And we do have so much. Let me read some stats. This comes from the book uh, by Richard Stearns. He's the president of World Vision. He writes in his book, The Hole in Our Gospel. He, write, he, he writes this, this. I just want to read some, some of this stuff to you. Nine million people die each year because due to hunger. A child dies from hunger every five seconds. 200, man, 200, 200 million man hours are used every day to gather water. Let that sink in. 200 million man hours are used every day to gather water. Not my problem. Not every week, not every month, not every year. Every single day, people have to spend 200 million hours a day to go gather water. 
hundreds and thousands and millions, and there, I just say billions of people have, this is their reality. Traveling kilometers and miles to gather water, 200 million man hours a day. 20% of the world, 1.4 billion people, live on a dollar a day or less. Now, to give you a comparison, the average income for Americans is $105 a day. One, 105. Now, I'm not saying that because I have so much now, and because you have so much, that you are to sell everything that you have and give it all away. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that there is some inequity in this world. John was right when he said, if you have two, give one away. To meet the needs of that 20%, it would cost $13 billion to provide basic health care for one year. It would cost $9 billion to provide clean and safe drinking water. It would provide... It would cost $6 billion a year to provide education for the children of that 20%. In comparison, in America, we spend $705 billion a year on recreation and entertainment. We spend $58 billion a year on lottery tickets. We spend $31 billion a year on pet care. Now, I love my dog. Our dog has a budget line item because we found that he has allergies or whatever dogs get. And so we buy, we buy our dog special dog food. He lives on more than a dollar a day, our dog. I'm just saying. Now, I'm not saying give it all away. I'm just saying that today, as we talk about generosity in view of, of the most generous gift ever given, Christ going to the cross to bear our sins, we might prayerfully consider what we might do. I've listed in your little sermon note packet the 12 organizations that Gwen and I will be supporting in the next calendar year. We've decided that one of the things that we have way too much of is clothes. And we realize that some of our clothes will, will wear out. We'll have to buy new underwear or socks or something. But we've decided that we're going to take our clothes budget and split it in half. And so for every dollar we spend on clothes, we're going to give a dollar away. And we're going to give it away to these 12 different organizations throughout the year. I'm not asking you to do what we do. I'm just asking you to prayerfully consider what you might do. Because John was talking to us when he said, if you have two, give one away. The same for the food. So now we have the what and we have the how and I believe now here is the why and we'll do this real quick because we're behind. In John 13, 31 to 35, it says these words. As soon as Judas left the room, Jesus said, the time has come for the Son of, of Man to enter into his glory and God will be glorified because of him and since God receives glory because of the Son, he will, will soon give glory to the Son Dear children, I will be with you only a little longer. And as I told the Jewish leaders, you will search for me, but you can't come where I am going. So now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. The ESV translates it this way. By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now see, Christ never called his followers Christians. 
That was something that the church, that the people of Antioch hoisted on the church of Antioch when they saw them gathering. They said, well, those people are like little Christ. Let's call them Christians. Christ calls us disciples. Disciples have <laughs> come from the same word as discipline. Christ wants us to live a disciplined life one that is measured, one that is on purpose, one that is examined, one that is, is, is prayerful, a life that, that means something. Because of all that we have been given, God desires that we, say, that we take it in, we appreciate it, and then we give it away. And he says the best way that you can, you can know that you live this thoughtful, disciplined, examined, prayerful life is if you have love, for one another. It doesn't matter how you worship. It doesn't matter what song you sing. It doesn't matter if, if you're a signs and wonder person or a King James only person. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what size church you go to or what size car you drive. It doesn't matter how much you give to the church or where you serve in the church. What does matter is that if I can look at you and see that you love one another, that's what truly matters. I have called you to be my disciple. I have, I have called you to live a discipline, measured, thoughtful, on purpose, prayer-filled life. I am calling you to love one another. And I call you to love one another because I first loved you. While you were still sinners, I came to this world and I died for you. While you were in your addiction, while you, you were in your selfishness, while you were in your adultery, while you were in your disobedience, I came and died for you. So that when now you are my disciple, I would ask that you love one another. So as we get ready to take the bread and the cup, I would invite the folks that are going to serve to come up. And I would ask that you would prayerfully consider as the band plays, as the communion is passed out, you would prayerfully consider what does love one another mean for you? It might mean what it means for Gwen and I in this season. It might mean to turn loose more of our finances over to help the poor of this world. It might mean that, you know what, God has now called me to get involved in, 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 in a new ministry or to, to join a small group for the first time or maybe to, to step out in faith and actually tithe to the local church. I don't know. But I do know that all of us have margin in our life to give more. Not just our money, but our time, our energy, or resources to show the world that we're disciples because we love one another. Reflect as these are passed.